Welcome back, guys. The next talk unites two different fields in the product making process with a single goal in mind, the users. Our next presenter will share with us the key principles behind successful collaboration between design and data science teams. And we welcome here today a product and design leader who focuses on empowering big organizations to build more customer-centric products with human-centered design. Help me in welcoming Crystal Yan. Crystal, welcome to HIPCON. The floor is yours. Hello? OK, great. Uh, thanks so much for uh, coming out today. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. So my background is as a product manager, but I work with data scientists every day. And the story I'm going to share with you today is actually from a role I had in a previous organization. Um, in my current role, I do work with the data science team every day, but a lot of the work that we do is kind of more behind the scenes, where our users and our customers don't actually see the results of some of our machine learning work. Um, but the story I want to tell you about today is how do you design for a case where you are actually displaying the result of that work to your users, and you don't want to confuse them. So before I get into that, I'll just quickly define what I mean when I say certain terms today, just because I know that in different contexts, it might, uh, a particular term might mean different things. So when I say data science, I'm referring to anything from a uh, more business and analytical and statistical approach to analyzing business data, um, and then also to uh, teams of computer scientists or um, teams who have an economist background who are using methods like machine learning. Uh, when I say the term artificial intelligence, I'm referring to any number of methods that might include machine learning, that might include other processes such as la natural language processing, um, computer vision, or facial recognition. Though in the context of the story I'll tell today, it's primarily about uh, applied machine learning. And so when I say ma applied machine learning, what I mean is uh, what do you do when you're a business and you have a lot of data that you can leverage um, and you want to use that leverage, uh, that data, to not only look at what's happened historically, but also to predict what might happen and model out what might happen in the future. And so in that case, I might mention uh, the way that our team used predictive analytics to display that to end users. Cool. So what will I talk about today? Um, so I'll start off by telling you a little bit more about why this mattered to me and why I decided to you know, uh, come up with a talk that was about this topic in the first place. I'll then share three lessons that I personally learned as a product manager and designer who partnered with data scientists on thinking about how to do user research a little bit differently in the context of machine learning products. And then finally, I'll try to bring some of those lessons learned to life with a specific example of a project that my team worked on. So as you can probably imagine, um, uh, I started off thinking about this because I would look around and I would see artificial intelligence mentioned in pretty much every single article ever. Um, and when I looked at a lot of the systems around me, I realized that a lot more of these systems were powered by artificial intelligence every day. And at the time that I started thinking about this issue, I was working in a company where a, lot, a number of our customers and our clients would actually come and ask me, oh, so you know, like you work with data scientists a lot. Do you think algorithms are gonna take over my job? And at first I laughed and I told them, of course not. I mean, and then I started to think about, you know, what are the jobs that are potentially least likely to be at risk for um, being taken over by algorithms? And I thought, oh, surely it would be the case of a profession that's very highly educated, very specially trained. Surely someone like a doctor would be safe. And then I read this article in the New Yorker that was talking about the um, situation where they did a study, and um, uh, one thing that you do as a doctor is you look at um, a couple of x-rays, and from that you're supposed to determine if you can diagnose a patient with a particular disease. And so they did a study where they gave a bunch of images to board-certified physicians, and they asked them to diagnose those patients, and then they took those same images and fed them to a machine, and they asked the machine to diagnose the patients. And it turns out the machines were more accurate. But what this um, article also went into was that it's not just about accuracy. A lot of times when we interact with uh, systems like this in this context, what really matters to patients is being able to interact 
with a diagnosis. So if you sit down and you go to a doctor's office and they tell you you've been diagnosed with something, you can ask questions. And the doctor can tell you, you know, they can ask some follow-up questions and say, maybe this is due to s recent stress in your life. Is there anything that, that was stressful that happened recently? And you can engage in that dialogue and better understand your diagnosis. And so even though um, the machines were more accurate, a lot of times human patients really preferred interacting with doctors because what the machines gave was a black box. Like they gave an answer that was more accurate, but people didn't understand why. And it was really that question of why that I later learned as I was working on this project at work that mattered a lot to our users as well. And then at the time, I was working at an enterprise software company. So we made software that other businesses bought. And I happened upon this article that a venture capitalist wrote. And he talked about how Salesforce was investing in developing machine learning products. And the question he posed was, that's really great, but are people actually going to be willing to pay for it? And whether or not someone's willing to pay for it really depends on if they trust it. And it turns out whether or not someone trusted something really depended on if they believed your answer for why you gave a certain prediction. And uh, that sort of all uh, led me to start thinking about how I can apply this in my own team and for the products that we were developing as well. So I started doing a little bit more uh, contextual research to understand the trend of machine learning and software products and found that there were a number of people who talked about the impressive uh, advances that artificial intelligence would have in the next few years. Also a couple of startup founders who spoke to the fact that while there has been a lot of investment in artificial intelligence to advance computational intelligence, there still wasn't enough investment in thinking about how artificial intelligence can improve social or emotional intelligence. And so this founder in particular, she uh, spoke about how um, her uh, company is really trying to think about how to use artificial intelligence to help children with autism be able to better respond and engage with their parents. And this is an example of a field or a context where artificial intelligence historically hasn't just been, um, we haven't invested enough in that, but it has a tremendous impact on uh, the potential for this technology to impact society more positively. And in the same way, um, uh, the director of an AI lab at Stanford also spoke to how it was really important for artificial intelligence for uh, to be developed with diversity in mind. And this led me to think about an article in ProPublica a few years ago where they spoke to the fact that a system was being developed and used by judicial courts to understand if certain prisoners were more or less likely to commit another crime. And in order to do that, uh, they looked at historical rates of, you know, certain... Uh, uh, certain people who had been in jail, and then whether or not they were more likely to get rearrested again. And they were using this technology to determine the sentencing of, uh, uh, of someone when they were being sentenced in the first place. But the problem with this approach is that it relied on historical data, and a lot of that historical data uh, was informed by decisions that very biased humans made. And so uh, with this kind of approach, it really led to an, uh, a situation where the application of artificial intelligence actually perpetuated inequality instead of actually improving it. Um, and maybe part of that is just due to the fact that different people weren't in the room when they were developing this technology. And so as I started thinking about uh, the approach that I wanted to take uh, with the way that we approach developing machine learning products on our team, I wanted to keep all of this in mind, even if we were developing a product in the context of business software. And so what I wanted to share with you today are three principles that I learned for how we wanted to establish greater trust in our product so that people would understand the design and then also ultimately be able to feel confident making decisions based on the predictive analytics we provided. So the first principle that we, uh, that we uh, settled on was that less is often more. And what I mean by this is uh, if you think back to when you were in school and you think about when you were in math class and a professor uh, or a teacher, um, if they ever looked at your homework, it wasn't good enough that you had the right answer, right? They wanted to make sure that you demonstrated your work. 
And uh, as I was collaborating with my colleagues, who everyone on our data science team had a PhD in either computer science or economics, I realized that less was not more to them. <laughs> more was more. And um, we would often get into uh, this healthy tension within the product team and the data science team, where a lot of my colleagues really wanted to prove and add caveats to all the predictions that we had. And so, for example, uh, if we had some kind of statistical distribution, they really wanted to convey to our users, oh, well, this is only true for a certain percentage of the time, and they really wanted to add more accuracy. Uh, the problem was our users were not data scientists. They did not have PhDs, most of them. And so when they looked at too much data, it was overwhelming, and it actually became really easy for them to misread the data. And what we learned was that in this case, even though uh, some members of our team really wanted to show everything and show our work, uh, to make sure that it actually didn't get misunderstood by our users, we actually cut down what we ended up showing. And we didn't show all of the numbers behind everything that we analyze. The second principle that we learned was that it was really important to ask the right questions. And so what I mean by this is uh, doing user research for a machine learning product is actually quite different from doing user research for a, um, like any, any other digital product. I mean, it's similar many, time, um, many times, but it's also different to the extent that one of the biggest things you want to test is understanding. And most people don't want to admit when they don't understand something. And so, for example, um, if we ask someone, does this make sense, oftentimes we realize they would always say yes, even if it didn't make sense to them. Uh, another time was um, when some members of our team were engaged with doing some of the research themselves, they had a tendency to ask, do you like this? So we presented a couple of different design options, and we wanted to understand which ones people liked better. The problem with saying, do you like this, was people uh, want to please other people. And if they knew that we were the team that was behind developing this, sometimes they would say they liked it, even if they didn't understand it, and they didn't see themselves actually using something we designed to make a decision. Uh, other challenges we ran into were we wanted to come up with a catchy name for um, some features that we had and some products that we were launching. And we had this tendency at first, when we first started working on this, to try to ask our customers to help us. And we would ask them questions like, what would you call this? And this actually gave our customers a lot of anxiety, because their job was not product marketing. They didn't spend any of their time thinking about what they would name our product. And uh, it just made them nervous when they felt like they didn't have a good answer when we asked that question, that everything after that point in the interview just there was just like this awkward tension in the interview. And so we learned that oftentimes asking the right questions meant not just asking the question we wanted answers, answered, but to just figure out more clever ways to ask around this. So for example, uh, an example of a better question that we came up with was how would you explain this? And uh, for our users in particular of this product, a lot of them worked in organizations where there was a good amount of turnover on their team. So it was pretty standard that some members of their team would move on to different organizations. So we put them in a scenario that was familiar to them. And we said, imagine uh, a new person just joined your team, and you wanted to explain to them how you use this product. How would you explain this? And just by hearing their answer, we would get a sense of if it made sense to them, right? Because if they explained it and we realized, OK, that's wrong, we knew that they didn't understand it. And when the, we heard them explain how, when we heard them detail how they would explain the product to someone else, we also got a good sense of what words they would use uh, if they wanted to describe the product. And that ultimately helped us with naming certain features and also naming uh, new product lines. But the most important takeaway I think I had was to listen very closely to the questions they asked us. And one trick I learned was that it's very tempting at the end of the interview to ask, oh, do you have any questions? But instead, you'll want to ask something more specific. You, you might want to ask, what questions do you have? It's, it's very subtle, but if you ask, do you have any questions, most of the time people will be lazy, and they'll just say no. Um, 
But if you ask what questions do you have, people will start to think, oh yeah, what questions do I have? It kind of frames it as assuming, I'm sure you have questions. Certainly you must. Um, what questions do you have? And when they asked us questions, that really revealed what they didn't understand and also what their concerns were about how we could improve the product. It's very similar, I think, to when you want to ask feedback for your, from your coworkers. It's not enough to just ask, uh, do you have any feedback for me? Uh, I always find that it's uh, useful to ask, what's one thing I do that I should keep doing? And what's one thing that I don't do or that I don't do well that I think I should change? Um, what's one thing, one specific thing I can do to improve? <coughs> so the last principle uh, that I learned from going through this process of designing machine learning products was that writing well really mattered a lot. And what I mean by this is this comes from the discipline of content strategy or UX writing. I uh, didn't realize that um, there's a very different approach that you have to take to writing for uh, product uh, and copy than writing in general for general content. So first of all, I'll admit, I'm the first person who always thought that if I weren't a product manager, I'd want to be a journalist. And what that means is sometimes I have this tendency to try to create a really elaborate story when I'm writing. Um, I really want to focus on thinking about how can I really immerse someone in this situation. In the context of writing for your product, that's too much. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I knew, I, uh, when I know myself and I know my own writing style, I know the approach that I want to take when I want to apply that to writing for a product. So for example, what I'll typically do is I'll write the way that um, something might, like the way that I would explain something to someone if I were just talking to them. And then I cut back and try to think about how can I make this much more concise. And over time, I realized that the approach I ended up taking was I started off by first thinking about who our audience was and what was the purpose of the writing in particular that I wanted to uh, lead with. I then set the tone of what I wanted to write, and I really matched that to the brand of the product. So for example, my default writing style is something that's maybe a bit quirky or um, casual. But in the context of the product I was working on at the time, which was uh, legal software for different businesses, quirky wouldn't actually work out very well for our business. Our uh, customers really wanted to be able to trust our product to make really serious business decisions. And so the tone of our voice in our product uh, had to match that brand. And then the last thing was just to try to learn how to be more concise. So in the context of a lot of writing decisions we had to make, sometimes I focus on just explaining what the solution was and then providing the evidence after for those who, uh, who were looking for that. And I'll get into a specific example of that later on. And then here I've also included a few resources that you can use as you start to think about how to apply language writing to your own work. Okay, great. So what I want to get into next is thinking about how to tie this all together into a very specific example. So I spoke about this earlier. Uh, at the time that I uh, started thinking about a lot of this work, I was working on a product that was a B2B legal software product. So the company was called Fiscal Note, and our end users were people who worked in public policy they were responsible for telling their company when certain legislative or regulatory changes were about to happen and would, it would have a material impact on their business. And they were also responsible for planning how the business would if they decided to respond to this. And the process that we followed for thinking about how we could uh, address some of the problems that our customers had and come up with solutions that would uh, meet those needs were we started off always by thinking about defining the problem and spending a good amount of time on discovering what it would take to develop that uh, a potential solution. Uh, we would get together in teams to ideate and prototype different solutions, uh, test those prototypes with our users, iterate on those before we started uh, to develop the product or the feature at all. And so what that meant was that uh, we had an opportunity to really improve the way that we conveyed some of our machine learning features. So here's an example of a very early version of something called our predictive analytics score. 
this was, um, the original version of this was designed by our first data scientists and our first engineers. And uh, what you might notice is that um, there's a lot of numbers there. <laughs> Uh, we promise a lot of things in this first version of our product. What you see here is a prediction for how likely a piece of legislation would get to the floor of a particular legislature, and then once it got to the floor, how likely it would be to pass. People had a really hard time understanding the score, and one of the reasons they had a really hard time was that this was a distribution to help put into context how, um, how significant this percentage was. So what our data scientists wanted to convey was that a 95.6% in one state um, in Minnesota actually meant something that was more uh, significant than a 95.6% in another state. But what a lot of our users thought was that this was a time series graph. They thought this was the likelihood of this bill to get to the floor over time. So they thought, like, oh, looking at this pattern, it actually looks like it used to be much lower, and now it's much higher. Um, and because people were misunderstanding this, uh, they couldn't make good decisions based on this um, analytics. So I mentioned to, er to you earlier that one of the most important things we learned was to listen to the questions people ask us. And the most common question that people ask when we were d testing different prototypes of this was, why is it that score? And you can see here there's actually a couple reasons for why there is a particular score. But a lot of this language didn't really mean anything to a lot of our users. So for example, it says here, you know, the primary sponsor has a po somewhat positive effect. What does that mean? <laughs> um, and what, what it was meant to convey was that it had a positive effect on uh, the likelihood of passage. But for our users, sometimes they didn't want a bill to pass. Sometimes passing it was not actually positive, so it was really easy to misread that and figure out, um, to, to come to the wrong conclusion, that positive necessarily, in this case, also meant positive for their own business um, impact. And so uh, when we redesigned this, one of the things that we did um, was that we focused on just trying to convey what it meant for our customers. So we learned that when people were on the phone with some member of our sales team, they actually really understood what these scores meant. And the reason they understood it after we shadowed some of those calls was people literally interpreted the statistics for them. So they just said, you know, what this means is that compared to other bills in the same legislature, it's much more likely to pass. And so we prototyped a version where we redesigned it by just replacing that chart with words. And, uh, and then for the, uh, reasons for why that is, we conveyed, hey, here are the top three reasons that contributed to this particular score. And below that, we still actually had to work on improving that language, because you can see here it still says significant negative effect. Um, so the things that uh, I highlighted earlier that um, are you can see here in this one of the potential designs was we hid the numbers. So if you wanted to see them, you could still find them but they weren't immediately the first thing that you saw. We gave an explanation. We calculated this based on one, two, three, and we had a pretty conversational tone. When you read this, it feels like a human who is giving you insight, like you're reading a report from a consultant. And in the context of our users, that was actually really important. Uh, a lot of them built their careers on relationships that they had, and so they were generally pretty skeptical of uh, predictive analytics software in the first place. And so when we adopted this conversational tone, it really helped build trust with this particular type of users because we understood this is what it meant to do business in their industry. And what that meant to our company was that uh, at the time also, we actually had a pretty significant business decision to make where we realized that uh, the way that the product was priced before was actually such that uh, if you had the tier of the product that did not have the predictive analytics features, it was a certain price, and you had the product with the predictive analytics features, it was a significantly higher price. And what that meant for our very small startup was that a huge chunk of our revenue uh, was attributed to customers willing to pay for these predictive analytics scores. Uh, but the problem was they weren't getting enough value out of them with the previous design, and so they were thinking of dropping down to another tier. And so we wanted to redesign these scores 
but we also knew we had to get it right, because if we got it wrong, all of those customers would try to change their tier, and a huge chunk of our revenue would be gone immediately. One way that I tried to make the case that this was the right time for us to redesign this was I did a quick search on our in, uh, company's internal drive, and I found over 140 documents in our company drive that different employees had created to try to explain how the scores worked to other employees who just started. And I made the case that if our own employees can't understand how this works, how can we expect our customers to understand it? Uh, the key metric that we used during the time of trying to evaluate if different solutions were the right, uh, going in the right direction was that question that I uh, highlighted earlier, which was how would you explain this to a coworker? So we went through many, many different rounds of usability testing different prototypes, and only when we got to the point where every single person could concisely articulate how they would explain how these scores worked to a new coworker, and they were right, that's when we started to decide, OK, we've now concluded the discovery portion of the product development process, and we're ready to move to delivery. And this is a design that we feel confident that if we build it, it will lead to a significant material impact for our business. So to quickly recap, uh, the three lessons that I highlighted earlier for designing for machine learning products are one, sometimes less is more. In our case, specifically, when we were dealing with a predictive analytics product, it made sense to not show every single number. Uh, two, it really matters a lot to ask the right questions. And so when you're doing user research, don't just ask the question you want the answer to. You have to word the question creatively so people feel comfortable answering it honestly, and you get the qualitative data you need to make a good decision. You'll also want to listen for the questions that people ask you, because you'll get pretty good insights from those as well. And three, writing well matters a lot. You might not think that writing um, a more liberal arts skill um, and data science go hand in hand, but um, writing is really a critical skill that I learned um, in the context of UX writing anyway to really translate applied machine learning into products humans would actually use. And to go back to the question that someone asked me, uh, or that the client of ours asked us earlier, the question of, are algorithms going to take our job? Uh, the reality is that um, algorithms are more likely to try to help us with our jobs, but in order to make the most of it, we have to adapt our own skill sets. And sometimes that might mean investing in skills that you might not have thought were relevant to designing machine learning products in the first place. In the context of uh, the product that I just walked you through, and also in the context of the patients who wanted answers from a doctor more than a, um, a prediction from a machine, uh, sometimes people actually prefer something that's less accurate um, because they really want to understand why. But if you can have accuracy and you can explain why, that can be really powerful. So thank you so much. And now I'll open it up to questions. So I'll just start off by saying what questions you have. Thank you. Hi. I, a little bit. <laughs> Turn it on and then wait for a couple of seconds. Yeah, that doesn't work, I think. Now it's working. Now it's working. OK, <laughs> okay. great. Uh, so I'm going to cheat. I have two questions, if that's OK. okay. Uh, first question is, when you showed us the redesign, uh, it's really interesting that you sort of went for a conversational interface and ditched like the graphy visual aspect. Uh, I'm wondering if you had any pushback on doing that, because my experience is stakeholders always want like nice animations and graphs to make things like easier to explain and sell, basically. Uh, sure. the, se the second question, and I'll uh, <laughs> let you answer the first one, uh, is uh, basically you had these 140 Google documents. 
what's the situation now and are you still using Google Documents or have you moved on to something else? <laughs> sure. So I'll answer the first question first, which is um, uh, in this particular scenario, we did take a more conversational approach uh, to the design process. And it's true that uh, we did get pushback from stakeholders. I will say there's no silver bullet. I don't think necessarily what we decide to do in this case would apply to all contexts of um, a machine learning product. In just this particular example, I think it made sense given who our users were and what their needs were. Um, and uh, But I think maybe to get at what what's kind of at the level below um, your question is, like, how do you manage when there's pushback from stakeholders? Uh, the reality is we iterated on the design so many times. And so we really tried to demonstrate through this process that no one on our team was tied to a particular solution. The only thing we were really attached to was the problem we were trying to solve. And by demonstrating that we were able to let go quickly of certain concepts and test another one and get feedback from users and have real quotes from customers, um, showing that evidence to our stakeholders was really what helped them get more comfortable with trying a new design. Uh, if they knew that, you know, we've actually tested this with many different customers before, we have videos, we have quotes of how people have responded to certain designs, and that gives us evidence that this one element of the design is working, but this other element needs more work, and we're going to go through this process just in the design process uh, before we even start to uh, develop it and hand it off to our engineering team, that um, really helped alleviate some of the concerns that some of those stakeholders had, including executive stakeholders. Uh, your second question, which was about um, sort of documenting how the scores worked in, in Google Docs. Uh, well, so I, I'm not actually at that company anymore, so I can't really say what it is today specifically. But what I can tell you is that after, um, I highlighted this a little bit, which was um, I talked about the pricing model. Uh, shortly after we implemented this change to the product, we actually also changed our pricing. And we changed our pricing based on insights from our customers that it wasn't actually the analytics themselves that added twice as much value or three times as, as much value. It was actually having multiple people on their team uh, and that was when we started getting more clients that had teams of people using our product. And so we changed our pricing to reflect that, where we had a flat platform fee and then an additional fee for each individual user, similar to the way that a lot of software as a service companies price their products. And uh, because of that, that actually also de-risked some of the uh, hesitation from stakeholders going into the process that we were significantly changing the part of the product that people were paying a lot of money for. Just, yeah. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Any more questions? OK. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned briefly uh, the feedback that you received from customers. OK. Uh, could you please elaborate on that? Uh, how exactly did you measure that feedback, like physically through tools, surveys? Uh, were those customers sort of uh, working closely with you? Because th that's the biggest challenge for, for me on projects, how to measure that feedback from, sure. from customers. Uh, can I ask what type, of, uh, what type of company or product do you work in right now? It's actually very similar. OK. It's also analytics, not so much prediction, but it's analytics and reporting. OK. It's a B2B company. Yeah. OK, great. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, it's, it's tricky in the context of a B2B company. I mean, it's tricky in all companies, but I think it's especially tricky in a B2B company because you have your product team that wants to talk to customers, and then you also have the sales team that wants to talk to customers, and you also have the account management or customer success team. And whenever a client goes into a meeting with sales or customer success, they know that they're going to be upsold. So when they actually uh, and probably in many cases, rarely interact with someone from the product team, whether it's a product manager or a designer or an engineer. Um, they kind of sometimes go in, and I, in, in my scenario, this happened, expecting to be upsold and feeling a little bit confused when we're just like showing them a design, a prototype, and we're asking them to react to it and like complete tasks. Uh, 
they get confused because they're not expecting that. Um, but it's also eventually a relief <laughs> because then they realize we're not trying to sell them anything. Um, in this particular case, what we did was we did a number of usability tests of uh, design prototypes. So we had a clickable prototype that looked like it was already built to our users, but it was actually just a couple of different mockups that were stitched together. And then we had people complete certain tasks and respond to it. So we would take them to a screen, and we would ask them a couple questions, open-ended questions, and they would think out loud. And through that process, we better understood how they understood it, what concerns they had, what questions they had. Uh, it, I've done surveys before, but um, for this particular project, it wouldn't have made as much sense to do a survey because the key question we were trying to understand was why does this make sense or not? And when you want to ask a why question, it's better to use a qualitative research method, such as an interview. Um, if we wanted to do uh, a more, if we had a question like uh, what percentage of our users actually engage with this feature and what elements make sense to them or not, um, some, some kind of what question, uh, we might uh, have done a survey. But in this case, because we, were, we wanted really deep insight, um, we used interviews. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else have any other question? No? OK, thank you, Crystal. OK, great. Well, I'll hang out here in case people want to ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. Thank exactly. you.